While I'm sitting on two cushions, Tracy had to take her glasses off for the glare, and we have a weird kitchen background from the Airbnb I'm staying in, so we're off to a very good start. Hello and welcome. Here I have Tracy. Some of you might have seen her before if you're true OGs and have been here a while. Um, we did this video together, or I'll put it here, right here. This video, right here, where we, well, not we. I surprised Tracy with the help of Benefit Cosmetics and surprised her with $15,000 and a bunch of cheerleaders. It was very fun and made her very awkward. It was perfect. <laughs> which right. I knew it would, which was really <laughs> half the fun for me. I also have referenced Tracy a lot. I've referenced her in my audiobook, It's Not What It Looks Like. I've referenced her in numerous videos, like the one I made about why you should not use the term differently abled. She has been what I consider my disability mentor. Even though she herself is not disabled, she was my special education teacher in high school and completely transformed the way I see myself as a disabled woman and how I see the disabled community in general. So I really wanted to make this video with her and I want to state that at the time we are filming this, this is being pre-filmed, and at the time that we are filming this, we are following all COVID guidelines. Please remember that COVID guidelines are different city to city, state, province, country. It's different everywhere. Um, and this is being pre-filmed quite far ahead of when it's going live for you guys. So just wanted to shout that out. Please do your part and keep yourself and others safe. So in the title, you see that we're going to be talking about why to not use the word handicapped this time. And I did mention in the one about differently abled that I wanted to make one about handicapped. And the reason I wanted Tracy to be here for this is because she's really the one who taught me about it. So I had no idea before you brought it up to me that the word handicapped had kind of some negative background, negative connotation around it. I had never personally used the word because I find just here in Canada where we're from, it's not as widely used. However, in America, it's kind of like the default go-to term is handicapped more so than disabled, I find. Here, I feel like in Canada, people use disabled and accessibility or accessible more than they use handicapped. And the only time I really hear handicapped in Canada is like an older generation. But I feel like we've done a good job at phasing it out in Canada, but in America, it's still very popular. I still hear it sometimes in relation to parking spots and mm -hmm. uh, accessible bathrooms. Yes. And so in both of those cases, obviously the word accessible fits perfectly, but people still fall to this kind of default where they use the word um, handicapped when it's... it's, it's handicapped parking, yeah. handicapped bathroom. When I think accessible parking or accessible washroom just flows better, like it not only, it just sounds better, but it's also just way more empowering. And, and realistically, there's lots of reasons why people use those. Now we have universally accessible bathrooms that also conform to different people's gender identities and things like that. And so the word accessible just meets all those expectations instead of just this one kind of target demographic that they had in mind when they started using that word, I think. Right. And even like accessible bathroom stalls are often used by mothers who have strollers with them that aren't just going to leave their baby in the stroller like out of the stall. So. It is a wide variety of people who use that salt. It's accessible for different needs, not just somebody who has a disability. And as a, a high school teacher, we came through this, this time period where we all of a sudden had more and more students who identified as non-binary or transgender. And I was really impressed by how easily we could make that move within the school because we already regarded the bathrooms as accessible bathrooms. And so there was no question about, so how are we going to manage this? The answer was we already have accessible bathrooms. They're still accessible bathrooms. Um, and so because we were already accommodating uh, one group, it was really easy to then accommodate other groups as well. So I want, wait, okay. I went, when I went to high school, I had to go to the teacher's lounge to use the bathroom. Is that still the bathroom they use? Well, there's many, that's one, but there are ones on each floor. And we have two campuses, two buildings and three, two and three floors. And so there's an accessible bathroom on every floor. That is one of them, but it's no longer the teacher's lounge in that space. So oh, okay. it's not really the same thing. That was, I was always just the student like walking into the teacher's <laughs> lounge to go to the bathroom. I always thought it was so funny. I'd walk out of the bathroom and then like a teacher would be walking out of the bathroom and I'd be like, that still happens for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to like preface this by saying we're just sharing one perspective, but obviously you can do you. We're trying to spread a certain message and educate, but like everybody is going to do what they're going to do and feel a certain way about a certain thing. And certainly um, if you're speaking with someone who has a disability and they choose to use the word handicap, then that's the word you might choose to use with them. Exactly. their comfort level. I really feel like for me, the way I like to respect people's gender pronouns 
I also like to respect disabled people's choice in words. So it's like differently abled, I find super offensive and like can't stand. But if a disabled person chooses to use that and that's how they define and describe themselves, let them do that, you know, yeah. let them be themselves. But obviously this is my channel and you guys like to hear my life, my perspective, my experience, and, and that's what I'm bringing to you with this video today. And Tracy, who's the one who's really helped me kind of navigate that and open the door to allow myself to, to view myself in different ways and not just the way that society labeled me or the way society made me feel I had to think of myself. I wanna kind of go back because when I've kind of separately done my own research on why you shouldn't use the word handicapped, there's two different reasons or like there's two different thought processes that I've seen. And so uh, a lot of people talk, and I still talk about it this way, who knows what the real truth is. You can see lots of research on this if you look it up. But one thing that they talk about often is the image of a person with a disability on a street corner, cap in hand, the hand handicap, uh, begging for money. And why are they begging for money? Because they live in a society that doesn't give them the things that they need, that doesn't offer them the opportunities that they need. And so obviously that's not an image that we want to have associated with the disability population. And so that's one reason why people often say that they don't like that word handicapped. Yeah, obviously that's like a really negative idea. And I know there's lots of imagery of blind people like selling pencils on a corner to beg for money and things like that. So it's certainly like an image that I've grown up seeing and hearing about just within my own community of blind people. So when you open it up to all the disabled people, like that's just not really the way we want society viewing us as people who are literally a charity case, who need your handout, who need your help all the time, because we're at a place in society and in time where we are empowered and we are capable. And so yeah, it's just like a really negative vision. I think when you envision someone standing on a street corner begging for money, we have this really kind of pathetic image of them. And so when you think about the word handicapped, you think of it as something that's pathetic in the individual. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we think of it in more empowering terms, we can acknowledge that if they're standing on the street corner begging, it may be happening. But the reason it's happening is because society isn't set up to support them. And they don't have the kind of supports that they need to be able to do something meaningful with their life. Absolutely, because we do know that there's a huge issue with disabled people being unemployed. But that is not due to disabled people not trying to find work, not being educated, not being qualified, um, or able to do the job. It's because of the prejudice that exists in society and so many other reasons. So really when we put the onus on like the disabled person being the problem, it continues to put such a negative image of, of disability which ends up feeding so many other problems in society that come to disabled people. The other reason that people sometimes talk about the word handicapped being so kind of negative is just that it's a term that was given to people with disabilities by people in power and it wasn't really something that they ever really claimed for themselves. And so people were put into institutions because they were handicapped. People were put into special classes and special schools because they were handicapped. That word special is, is also high on the list of problematic terms. In fact, I recently saw a study through a UK magazine and it talked about special and handicapped being two of the top five words that people with disabilities hate the most. Mm. And so this perception of um, handicapped and the kind of envisionment that we have of it, the kind of depersonalization that it puts on people led to this kind of uh, idea that it was okay for them to be separated from society, that it was okay for them to be taken from their families. Put into institutions that were not treating them fairly, that were not giving them an education. Absolutely. I mean, if you if you watch the movie on Netflix, Crip Camp, it shows mm -hmm. some like very disturbing imagery of these these homes that they would segregate disabled people into. And the way they would treat them is truly jaw dropping. And this was not that long ago. That's it. A lot of this is stuff. Um, I often talk about how we can compare a lot of the things happening within the disability rights movement to the civil rights movement. And certainly we're as a society more aware of the ideas of systemic oppression through Black Lives Matter. And if you want to think of the ultimate example of systemic oppression, we can just think of a million different things that relate to disability. Mm. That's so much of the, of the disabling part of a disability comes from systemic oppression. And that systemic oppression is what 
automatically made families make the decision that yes, they would place them in institutions or yes, they would go for that, uh, that not very educational, educational opportunity. Right. Um, and so the, the kind of negative connotation that comes with the word handicap, whether you believe the idea of a cap in hand or whether you believe the idea that it, that it, it played a significant role on placing people kind of away from their families and into this kind of um, stigmatized role. What you can acknowledge is that people don't like it. People with disabilities don't like it. And so then we don't do it, right? Mm. Then we don't use mm -hmm. it. We talk a lot about different communities, different minority groups reclaiming words. And then it becomes something that can be empowering for them when they take that power back. But it's kind of a word that as a community, we haven't chosen to take that back. We're like, no, we don't actually need that back. You can, we can discard it entirely. And so, like you said, if that's, if that's what a community is choosing and is saying like, this is what I prefer, generally just don't do it because there's so many other options that were like, you know what? Here are options that are okay. If you could just use these, that would feel much more comfortable for me. Um, and I think just like, I talked about in the differently abled video, feeling like differently abled um, makes disability feel condescending. There's so many ways that people take handicapped, like calling people handicapable, that make it feel condescending to me as well. I know that people get confused by terminology and flustered by the fact that terminology changes a lot, and it does. There were times where probably it was okay. I don't, I don't really remember it even in my lifetime. I'm a lot older than Molly, but I don't remember in my lifetime when it was okay to use that expression. But the reality, the way that it changes is because the people who are being labeled identify a name that they're more comfortable with, a terminology they're more comfortable with. The terminology ends up being stigmatized. Certainly in my high school now, I'll hear kids sometimes refer to other kids as SPED, which is a short form that we might use for special education. It's not a terminology that I choose to use anymore because I've, I've heard from the disability community that it's not a term they're comfortable with. It drove me so nuts when I was in high school that it was called spec ed. It drove me nuts. I was like, why is this called spec ed? Which is obviously short form, like you said, for special education. It drove me nuts. But obviously I wasn't about to be like, stop calling it special ed. I wasn't there in my journey yet. Now if I was in school <laughs> and the person I am today, I would have marched over to you guys and been like, excuse me. And I think in most cases, individual departments bear this official title special ed, but within the department, they don't really use it that way. So the Board of Education still says we use this terminology, the, the Ministry of Education says we use this terminology, but on a practical level, we all acknowledge it as, as um, disability professionals, we acknowledge it as not a, as not a positive thing. Mm -hmm. And so we don't tend to use that expression anymore. We talk about learning resources departments and things like that. Can, can we talk about briefly, since we're like talking about terminology that isn't okay, why calling disabled people special is so up there on the list of words that we don't like and why special education isn't really a positive term. So in a really basic sense, the idea that, um, that you are getting special education because you have a disability, in a basic sense, it's not really realistic. There's not, not really anything that special about it. We know that all different students learn in all different ways. It's certainly been the push in education for a long time to meet the needs of all students. Um, I choose to teach in a way that's universally accept, um, accessible, but many people are just accommodating students as they come, as they go. It doesn't matter about um, what individual education plan they might have, what diagnosis they might have. We meet students where they are. And so that's what's normally happening in school. And so how is that any different if you have a more significant disability as Molly has, or if you um, need a, a lot of extra support? it's still just giving students what they need to be successful. It's still simply accommodating their learning style or their ability or you know what their needs are. It's not, it's not extra special. We're not, no. get, we're not yeah. getting privilege, yeah. right? Which is kind of what special says. It's like you're yeah. in some way privileged when mm -hmm. you're special. And but if you're, this if, is not a privileged circumstance that we're in. Yeah. If anything in society, we're like treated as less than. And when we think of it as a privilege, it also diminishes the experience of people with disabilities. We know that because of the way that society is set up, because of the way our school systems are set up and, and our workforces are set up, people with disabilities experience really challenging situations. And by saying that they're special, mm -hmm. um, it, it diminishes that, that aspect of their life experience. I also think it only continues to like segregate us in the minds of people because you're just putting us in like this separate box in the school system instead of like keeping us in the box with the other students. Um, like you said, just meeting their needs where they're at. So I think 
that's like another layer of why it's problematic. That, they, that those students those students take classes in this area when we take our classes in this area. And certainly society is moving more and more away from that. Um, they're trying to include people more to be more inclusive, but we certainly aren't there yet. And the word special only helps to kind of separate even more. Well, and speaking of like segregated education, obviously I've done these two videos about going to a school for the blind. And the reality is like when people ask me, why didn't you take all your schooling there? It seems like it would have been like so much easier to be in that environment. And I'm like, well, the reality is I was in a segregated environment. So yes, in ways that's easier, but that is not life. And I did not want to live in a segregated space for so long that it would be hard for me to transition to real life again. At the time, we had very limited options given my significant vision loss in a short span of time to get an education where they could really hone in on giving me all the skills I needed. And so for me, like in that time, it was right. And the, the time that I think going to a special school like that is right is in situations like that where it is a short term solution and you're transitioned back. Um, because I do feel like overall being segregated for a lengthy period of time is not good for mental health and also is not good um, for self development, self growth, self identity and understanding and just being able to adapt and cope within a society that ultimately is not built for you. And when you use the word special to refer to a school like that, we might rephrase it a little bit or we kind of position it in our head a little bit and say a specialized school, right? Mm -hmm. And so we can say that there was a period in time where Molly felt like she really needed some specialized education. And so it wasn't that the education was so special as much as she was surrounded by people who really understood it and could best accommodate her. And so she did that for a period of time working with specialists, just as you often would if you would go through experiences in your life that are um, really difficult. But once she kind of got, got, got a handle on that, then she could move off mm -hmm. into a kind of more mainstream experience. Well, I think it's important that you reference, like that's something that people often do is get like specialized training in some type of area, because one problem that we face in the blind community, specifically in Canada, I can't speak to the situation in other countries, but in Canada, you know, if, if I had a spinal cord injury and was dealing with paralysis, I would go to rehabilitation in a medical center. It would be considered a medical need. But when you go blind, you have to go to a charity. There is, it's not considered a medical rehabilitation. Your rehabilitation is considered charity. And so it means that a lot of the funding that is going to charities like the CNIB, Canadian National Institute for the Blind, is being put into our rehabilitation and not into other things that we would need in society to be successful and flourish. And so it's a real problem that other disabled people uh, are given medical rehab through government funding um, and it's considered a medical need, whereas our rehabilitation is not considered medical. And because of that, a lot of blind people don't want it. It's very hard to go blind and then be told, go to this charity and get help. But if, you're, if you go blind and you're told, go down the hall, to this other medical office mm -hmm. where you'll receive help. It's just a natural it's, next step in the process. Right? Exactly. And so there's, there's, it's a whole different topic, a whole different issue, a whole different conversation. But realistically, what I experienced was rehabilitation. I experienced my rehab at a specialized school that could train me in what I needed. Um, and that's why I went there. And that's why I treated it like rehabilitation, which doesn't last for many, many, many years. In my case, it needed to last for a year or two. And because of the small population of people who are blind, Molly going to that specialized school had a certain purpose. But if she had continued on there, the, re the reality is the, the number of courses available to you when you have a really small school population is really limited. Whereas if, if she ended up moving into a school that was much, much larger and so had unlimited possibilities of courses that she could take. Um, which would then lead to all different job opportunities. And so when we already know that people who are blind and people with disabilities overall are really underemployed or unemployed, uh, we have to give them more opportunities for that. And more opportunities for that come from going to a bigger school that have lots and lots of course options versus going to a small segregated kind of specialized school whose business is really supporting blindness as opposed to perhaps preparing you for the best opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. And I, just like I said, I can't speak to rehabilitation for blind communities outside of Canada. I want to mention that like when we're speaking about terminology, like the word handicapped, I have heard from specifically my French viewers that they don't actually have an alternative word. In the French language, 
handicap is the only word. There is no equivalent like disability. This is what I've been told. I don't speak French. <laughs> so I want to say like, obviously we're, we're coming from an English language perspective where there is alternative words that you can be using. And so where you live, I can't speak to that. Obviously we've talked about a lot of different topics, um, veering off of the original <laughs> concept of why we sat down to talk about this, but that's always why I love having these conversations because when I'm just sitting down and having the conversation by myself, it just sticks to what I was sitting down to talk about. But when I get to bounce off of somebody else who's in this space and cares about it just as much as I do and honestly knows more about it than I do, it ends up developing into even more of a conversation than what I originally expected. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I really did. I think the way to end this off is to say, if you don't know what somebody prefers to be called or how they like to be identified, just ask them. I think we've gotten really used to doing that now with gender identity. And I think it just goes for a lot of different minority communities. Like just ask somebody what word they would like to be identified with. Yeah, that makes sense to me. All right. Thank you guys for watching this. And if you want to check out the video where I surprised Tracy with $15,000, you can check out this video right here. And if you want to see my video about the word differently abled or the term differently abled, you can check out this video here and we will see you in another video. Cause yes, we're filming another video right now. Okay. Bye. <laughs>